Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a special town hall with Chancellor Sam Hoggood in conversation with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. It's my pleasure to introduce Chancellor Sam Hoggood. Thank you, Lisa, and good morning, uh, everyone. I'm greatly honored this morning to introduce the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives and the representative of California's 12th District, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, to join us at UCSF this morning. Speaker Pelosi, thank you so much for joining us as you juggle the many competing demands on your time during this uncertain and unprecedented moment in our nation's history. We at UCSF have been so proud to have such a principled and experienced leader represent us in Washington for so many years. Never more so than now, as our nation faces a global health emergency, an economic crisis, and a long overdue racial reckoning. Here in California, we have also been challenged with devastating wildfires, all pointing to the adverse effects of climate change. As we go forward together to address these challenges, we know your trademark skill, courage, strength, and resolve will help us through. UCSF will continue to do our part to prevent, detect, trace, and treat COVID-19 while driving forward with new discoveries to help the nation. And we hope that you will continue to call on us to partner with you in your legislative efforts. We are here to help in any way possible. I know I speak for the entire UCSF community when I say thank you for being here today. We are looking forward to hearing more about your leadership in the face of this pandemic, lessons learned during your long tenure in the House of Representatives, and how we can be helpful advocates for science and health policy in the months ahead. Speaker Pelosi, I welcome you uh, to make a few opening remarks. Thank you very much, Chancellor Harlow, for your wonderful invitation to be with you, but more importantly, for your years of service uh, to UCSF and your great leadership now as Chancellor. Uh, it come, uh, it's always a privilege to visit UCSF, this time virtually, uh, but never a time more urgently uh, than when we have so many uh, uh, cross currents of how we meet the, need, the health needs of the American people uh, when we're in a fight about re respect for science as we do so. I say that though, uh, remembering very clearly decades ago when we, uh, we in San Francisco were blessed with the great intellectual and health resource that UCSF is uh, when we took that terrible, terrible taste of HIV AIDS right from the start at UCSF. Uh, it enabled me when I came to Congress to be able to have legislation, uh, legislation that led uh, to the Ryan White Care Act where we could show that in San Francisco, we had community-based research, community-based prevention, community-based care uh, because much of the, of the work that was done at UCSF. So for a long time, UCSF has been in the lead in our nation in terms of quality of ideas as well as implementation of them. So as we come together now at the time of a pandemic, uh, when you have uh, appropriately referenced the, the wildfires, uh, which are a part of climate issue, which is again, another issue where there is denial of the science uh, it really is very important for us to kind of to unify the country around the, the beautiful, beautiful gift that science is. Uh, in the Congress, sometimes they say faith or science. You have to choose between the two. And as a very devout Catholic, I always say, well, faith is an science is an answer to our prayers. That's not always the answer they want. But if whatever you're talking about, the answer is probably science science in terms of health, science in terms of preserving the client, science in terms of creating jobs, science in terms of defending our nation, protecting in terms of uh, sophistication and uh, uh, invention in order to protect our nation. It, it's in, in every way. And science for our children to learn about God's great creation. So thank you for the opportunity to be with you. I really would love to just get to questions because there's so much going on here. Uh, it is come, especially coming at a time 
when our state is suffering from these fires, the size of the Grand Canyon, the size of the state of Rhode Island, the size of Rhode Island. And we must, at, at the same time as our Gulf Coast is being hit uh, by hurricanes, uh, again, we must address uh, the climate crisis and we have, can only do that through science, 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 and science. So with that, uh, again, I welcome the opportunity to be with you. Uh, we have talked over the years about many of the aspects of Congress and UCSF. I'm so proud Jackie Spear and I pr uh, share the representation of UCSF in, in the Congress, and we're proud to do so. Uh, the, um, we're very proud of our Mayor Breed in San Francisco and what she is always doing, but now in terms of addressing the pandemic, and we're very proud of Governor Newsom and how he is leading us uh, statewide. We're not so proud about how we are being led uh, the executive branch on the national level, uh, but we are ever hopeful and prayerful uh, that we can get them on the right track. We can talk more about that depending on your, your questions. But with that, again, I thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. I'm so proud uh, to be associated in any way with UCSF and I thank you for your leadership in terms of the good health of our community, the intellectual resource that you are to the world, and the job creator that you are uh, for our region as well. So again, thank you, and I welcome any questions you may have. Let me thank Mark. We've worked over the years together, and I look forward to Francesca's questions uh, as we go forward. Thank you, Sam. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, you can see from the uh, the grayness outside the window here at Mission Bay that uh, we still have quite a bit of smoke, but I think it's uh, more fog than smoke this morning. So that's a, a good, a good uh, sign. Um, I'm so pleased that you uh, opened your remarks uh, with a reference back to the uh, early 80s when uh, we faced together the uh, HIV AIDS pandemic. Um, and uh, at that time, it was also difficult to get a coordinated national response. And I'm very proud that UCSF and, and San Francisco led the way, and it's been very helpful for us in this pandemic. But can you comment a little bit more on why lessons were not learned and we're still uh, facing difficulties in coordinating a national U U U US response to, to COVID-19? I'm trying to be, I, I want this not to be a political conversation, uh, try to be as, uh, shall we say, evidence-based as possible. And the evidence is that there was denial uh, when this uh, uh, pandemic first descended upon us. There was denial, uh, it was called a hoax. Uh, that delay, a denial and distortion of what it was set us back. Uh, the lack of uh, proper testing from the start was again another setback. Uh, we're all hopeful that it was not going to become what it has been, uh, but being hopeful is one thing, preventing that from happening is another, and there was just such denial. And, and now we did have four uh, bipartisan bills that we passed uh, to help uh, to the extent that we could find bipartisan agreement, very important, and some of that money in the uh, CARES Act came to UCSF, to, and part of that was to help students with tuition, but none of it was really enough, and that's why we need the HEROES Act now. Uh, the, uh, again, trying to sound as unifying as possible, there are two things here at work uh, that are not so good. One is an anti-science attitude, and the other is an anti-governance attitude. You don't believe in government. You don't want to have regulations for clean air, clean water, or whatever. And you don't believe in science, so you don't have to pay attention to science, and therefore you don't have to govern, so you're, you're just where you want to be, nowhere, in terms of progress for our country. And I think that anti-governance, because that costs money sometimes to govern, uh, and also it requires a recognition of science. So let's just hope that rather than looking back that we can look forward and hope that the public awareness of all of this uh, will take us to a place where we have unity around science. Now, the last couple of days have not been good. Administration came forward 
uh, with a, an exaggeration of what the plasma, what the initiative that the FDA put forth with a um, emergency use authorization uh, exaggerated by the commissioner, walked back by the commissioner. But hopefully that will be something that is a, a red light, a flashing light that says when we go forward with other therapies or with a, a vaccine, God willing and soon we pray, that they will not be fast and loose uh, with, the, uh, with uh, saying to the scientist, uh, we know efficacy and safety are your requirements. We have another one that trumps that. It's called speed. Well, if speed is not in the end, we want it as soon as we can possibly have it be efficacious and say not one day sooner than that, but not one day later uh, than it is and can meet the need. So again, governance, anti-governance, anti-science, that was part of it. And it's really, I do practice medicine on the side as a grandmother and mother. I, without benefit of diploma, I, I'm always giving people medical advice free of charge, whether they ask for it or not. I'm only now moving into the mental health sector. So I cannot explain to you the mentality that is at work um, uh, that chose to go this path. Uh, but uh, hopefully the more, I have Abraham Lincoln behind me here. He said, public sentiment is everything. With it, you can accomplish almost anything. Without it, practically nothing. So hopefully now the public sentiment that is out there about this, the concern that people have for their health, the health of their children, et cetera, uh, will uh, insist that the administration do things differently and that we can work together as we go forward. It should be unifying, it shouldn't be divided. Right. Well, if, if the regents of the university uh, changed their policy and allowed us to give out honorary degrees, we would be more than happy to give you an honorary degree in, in, in medicine or nursing or any other health profession. I I will virtually accept that. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, you know, in terms of advocacy for science, the great research universities of the country and the academic medical centers across the country obviously stand up for science uh, every day. Um, and we, since the turn of the year, really have turned our uh, research might to uh, this new virus and uh, incredibly exciting things are coming out of the labs here at UCSF as well as uh, other universities across the country. You know, history tells us that COVID-19 will definitely not be the, the last pandemic that we experience in our lifetimes. And I've been thinking and speaking to my peers across the country how we could perhaps uh, create a more unified uh, research university academic response in, in working with the federal government to prepare the country uh, uh, for what we know will come and I just, any thoughts that you have on that approach as a, as a supplement to the wonderful agencies such as the FDA and the CDC, how, how universities could, could help the federal government and the people of the country as we prepare for the inevitable next time? I think, it, I think that uh, again, from your great scientific mind, a, a great idea on how we can go forward to uh, exploit all of the opportunities that science has to offer in a way that, that saves time and, and benefits the American people. We do have a, a bit of a model. I had the privilege in the 1990s uh, as a, a member of the Appropriations Committee, I was tasked with three other people, uh, Tom Harkin in the Senate, How, uh, Alwyn Specter in the Senate, and John Porter, Republican, in the House. The four of us were tasked to double the H NIH budget over five years. Uh, we didn't know if we could do it, but we knew we had to start. And, and what, how it relates to your, your point is that we immediately brought in all of the leadership of the leading uh, institutions of higher learning in our country, including UCSF, of course, starting with, and being from Baltimore, John Hopkins as well, but all of the uh, leading um, administrators. And uh, we said to them, you know, you have, you have, a great alumni list. You have boards of governors, visitors, trustees, whatever you call them, uh, who are influential in the community. You all have to join us in calling upon others in Congress to support the funding, the doubling of the NIH budget. It was our belief, and it continues to be our belief to this day, that is the best dollar spent 
by the, the U.S. government. The biblical power to cure, and in the case you mentioned about a pandemic, even more urgent, the biblical power to cure, and um, uh, the dollars spent not only create jobs, not only science jobs, but electricians, plumbers, carpenters, uh, assistants, all different kinds of jobs. That's one thing, but create answers, solutions, illuminations. Uh, so but with that, we also doubled NI, um, National Science Foundation, the rest recognizing the connection between the hard sciences and the uh, ability to enlarge, to magnify, to compute, uh, to help us get quicker down the road, genome project and other things. So looking at that and how scientists came together to get this done, I think speaks to uh, your suggestion in a way that they will have ideas about how it might work uh, from their perspective across the country involving the entire, unifying the country around this idea that never again will the United States of America be, fall short in our leading the world in our response. Uh, the, we were, we had some of this in the Obama administration, which was dismantled in the Trump administration. Don't ask me why, I don't know. But, but, um, but nonetheless, we even have to go well beyond that. And what you called for is, is brilliant, it's exciting, and I think it would excite uh, uh, leaders, not you are exceptional, but leaders in, in, in your field around, uh, around the country. To, uh, I look forward to working with you to get that done, and if that requires any legislative action, let's do that. But it certainly will require legislative funding. So I look forward to uh, uh, working with you on that. It's it's so necessary, right? I mean, it's so obviously necessary. And uh, uh, thank you for that brilliant suggestion. Well, thank you for, for your support. Um, uh, and thank you for, for the HEROES Act uh, that you uh, pushed through and the support for the NIH in that act and also the support for caregivers. Uh, one, of the, one of the real existential challenges that we're seeing uh, evolve here at, at UCSF and I suspect is uh, true around the country is that we are potentially at risk of losing a generation, particularly of early career women faculty in the research community. Um, as, as a parent and grandparent, you understand the pressures yeah. that uh, caregivers uh, are feeling as a result of COVID-19, and it's been particularly impactful uh, on, on our early career women faculty. And we're, we're trying to see what we can do alone here at UCSF to preserve a generation of brilliant scientists. But um, uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts that the federal government might be able to help there as well. Well, the... Uh there has to be a recognition uh, that UCSF long ago recognized that the need for, to grow the talent involved women, uh, uh, diversity in, in the ranks to have the, brilliant, the benefit of all of that thinking. And I remember in the past when we've had budget challenges coming to UCSF and meeting not only with your leading scientists, but the folks who worked uh, with them and how they saw their career paths just demolished by the fact that we would not have the federal funding that would be necessary to support. The uh, money is really important in this because uh, we don't fund as many um, grants as we should. We would have to do more and we are doing more, but we need to do more because only then will we reach the, the diversity that we need to reach, as well as diversity and gender, but also uh, otherwise as well. So um, uh, to those young people, especially now with this, because it's people are risking their lives to save lives, and now they may lose their jobs. Uh, for them to go to work, they may have to risk their lives and bring something home to their children. Uh, the children cannot go to school because of the uh, actual is not happening, it's mostly virtual, then how are they going to go to work unless we support them with childcare? So we are making a massive investment in childcare, actually in the 
Heroes Act, we have about $55 billion, $55 billion. But on the floor of the House, beyond pandemic, we have $210 billion, both using the tax code and using the um, appropriated function and policy to, uh, to make health uh, child care available, especially when we're talking about parents and their uh, career path. Uh, scientifically, or even just not, not, if they're not inventing, they're caring uh, for people, and that is such a valuable part of, of the good health of our country. So we see it all connected. We see it connected in uh, greater investments in our research and development and the NIH and extramurally, as, as is benefits. Uh, institutions like UCSF, not that there's anything like UCSF, but it's in the category of, of an out, out, outside the walls institution, uh, but also uh, to recognize uh, that, again, we always say when women succeed, America succeeds, for women to succeed, although dads take care of the children too, by and large, we want them both, moms and dads, uh, to have the childcare they need to go forward. We also have to have some debt forgiveness and a, a better, a more affordable way for the education uh, to happen in this. And um, in the HEROES Act also, we correct what the uh, state of California, the state of Texas had uh, their own version of how docs could take advantage of a debt for, uh, given, loan forgiveness. Uh, and that we, hopefully this will become law or this part of it will become law, even if the whole bill doesn't, uh, so that we can correct the Texas-California uh, challenge there. But I thank you for recognizing that our healthcare is only as good as it is, represents every aspect of our society. And you would think that that is something that everyone would encourage, not only by the education of our, our healthcare providers, our scientists, but also by including everyone in the loop to be avail to be uh, have access uh, to healthcare because we all learn from each other. The epidemiology of it all benefits the more we know, and that's the beauty of UCSF, a place in a place so diverse as San Francisco and California uh, that um, you learn from your patients, and your patients benefit uh, from that knowledge as does every other person. I always say the most privileged person in America, I don't care how rich he or she is, they all benefit from the, by the poorest people in America having access to health care because we learn from each other. Well, that's a, that's a great uh, transition to perhaps uh, the next question because one of the things that has been clearly underscored by the pandemic is the enormous disparities in health outcomes, not, not just for COVID-19, but uh, more broadly across almost any any disease type. One of the things that uh, we have done, and you may have read about in April, a group of our researchers uh, partnered strongly with the community and did a study of uh, coronavirus infections in, in a census tract in the, in the Mission District. That tract is 58% Latinx, but we found that the incidence of uh, coronavirus infection was 11 times higher than the city average and 95% of the people who tested positive were Latinx. And uh, I think this was the first study to really underscore the disparities in, in the pandemic and also underscored that for testing to be successful, it will need to be smart testing um, uh, along the lines of the Precision Medicine Initiative, really test those populations that we, we know are most challenged here. And, um, I, I hope uh, that uh, we could be of help to you as testing strategies uh, uh, continue to be developed, how we can deploy this limited resource uh, in, in the most effective way possible. So any, any thoughts on how we can help get that message out that uh, we need to do smart testing as well as just universal testing? I appreciate that. And I did, uh, I obviously um, uh, was saddened and stunned to see the results of your study. And, but it is indicative of what is happening in the country. And it was something that I could use uh, as an example of uh, some scientific research 
uh, because uh, people will say, that's an anecdotal one. I said, well, in appropriations, I, and you've heard me say this, Sam, so many times, the plural of anecdote is not data. Mm -hmm. However, data is data, and you had data. So it was more than uh, an, uh, an example of something. It was uh, scientific, and that was, has been very valuable, and I thank you for that. Right now, in the, in the HEROES Act, we have a large amount of money for testing. And what we wanted to do was to um, redress the, the, the fact that the disparity in communities of color is a re total reality in all of this, unless we have testing, tracing, treatment, isolation, of course, wear your mask and, and sanitation and the rest. But those things that we could do uh, 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 public entities, this is absolutely essential. It takes money. But not just to take money, it takes data. So in the previous, one of the previous COVID bills, we insisted that they get the data, give us the data, how uh, our communities were affected when, when there were tests were made, et cetera. And, and what you did see uh, uh, not as much as we would have liked them to do it, but nonetheless, the, uh, just publicly, you see uh, that the communities of color are, are hit very hard and there are many deaths out of proportion to the demographic, the number of people in, the, in our country. So, so if for us, when we're talking to them and we say, we insist if we're going to do this, we want you to do it. They don't want to do it. We want you to do it, but you have to do it scientifically. We have to keep track of what is happening. And they say, don't tell them I told you this. They say, do you know how hard it is to keep track of them? Yes. And that's why we have to do it. Because if you're going to have the smart testing, we have to be able to use our resources in a way and it's immoral. It's immoral for us to proceed with this without recognizing the disparity in the communities of color. You know that better than anyone, but we have to kind of convey that to some people who don't, uh, shall we say, are not as close to the public experience as, as some of the rest of us are. But uh, I, I would welcome any suggestions you have about making that test and find what we're trying to do, and, and the Bay Area will be a sort of intellectual source for this, is to have quicker results. Right. Quicker results. The quicker we get the results, and then, uh, then we can trace when it has more meaning because it isn't seven days later. <coughs> so the, te bless you, the testing and the and, and tracing and then the treatment. Now they say that us, testing is overrated. Oh, really? Treating, tracing is hard to do. Yeah. Um, how are we going to do the treatment if we don't know? So we have to quantify it all. And again, we want it to have, to use your word, the precision uh, of uh, exactly who is impacted and how we can help. And one of the big pieces of this is also the uh, isolation of uh, keeping people separate once they are diagnosed. Because I work someplace, I'm afraid to get tested because if I do, I might lose my job or what, how am I going to go home and all of that. Well, it takes money, but it saves lives and stops the spread. We just have to recognize uh, that if we're, uh, if we're going to crush we're going to crush this virus, which we must do, uh, that it is going to take resources scientifically spent, again, with the data to see the results of what is working uh, so that we can, again, make sure and be ready for when there is a vaccine, God willing, soon, for therapies that they just don't go to, shall we say, the whitest, richest people that anybody knows, but they go to everyone, everyone, everyone in our community. It is, um, it's something we have to pray over because not everybody, uh, shall we say, has the benefit of having UCSF in their district and understanding that uh, it's not, uh, you can save a lot of time, money and lives if you start 
from a scientific basis. Well, thank you. Thank you for that uh, understanding and leadership. I'm going to ask just one more question before I hand it over to uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Vega for taking questions from the audience. And this is uh, perhaps a little more, a little more personal. Um, could you, you, you've been in Congress now for uh, many decades and have uh, seen many different leaders, leadership style, uh, role models, uh, anti-role models. Um, could you comment briefly on how your approach to leadership has changed over time and what, what lessons you've found are most useful for aspiring leaders? Well, for, for aspiring leaders, I would say the best advice I ever received, Sam, was, uh, Mr. Chancellor, is to um, be yourself. Be yourself. Authenticity is everything in what we do. You know that scientifically. But authenticity and um, be who you are. And you, there's nobody like you. You are the unique you can make your special difference. So over the years, when I, I never intended to go to Congress. I never intended to run for public office. I'm basically a very shy person. Well, I used to be anyway. And, uh, and then but, people uh, wanted me to run for Congress. And I thought, I'm never going to run for Congress. I have five kids. But by then, my children were, four of them were in college, five and six years, five and six years. See, so that's why the children, the children, the children are my three most important issues in Congress, their health, their education, the economic security of their families, and their um, the uh, safe, that means gun safety too, environment in which they can thrive, as a world at peace in which they can reach their fulfillment. And so it's about the children. One in five in America lives in poverty. I say that, again, if you say, what guidance would you give? Know your why. Why do you want to be engaged in whether it's science or public office or whatever, the military, what, know your why. When you know your why, that gives you the confidence that what you know about that subject and the judgment you bring to it and the plan you have to make a difference will attract so much support to you because it is authentically you, genuinely you, uniquely you. So know your power in that regard. And the more diversity, the better. I say that with all the respect in the world for my dear husband and brothers and all the rest. It's not that we're better, women are better or whatever. It's just you need the diversity of opinion there. So uh, I so I never intended to run. Then they asked me to run, so I ran. I won. Oh my gosh! And now I'm going to Congress. Never intended to run for leadership, but after a period of time, people came to me and said, "You should run for leadership." No, I I love my appropriations committee, Labor HHS, the committee that funds the NIH and the rest, and uh, and foreign ops. I loved my committee work and intelligence. There were two places I was forged: intelligence and appropriations. By and large largely bipartisan, not highly partisan committee. And then, and then I um, decided to, to run for leadership and, and here I am. But it wasn't a path that I was on. But what I, in terms of over the years, 33 years this summer, I'm 33 years in the coming, it, it's about um, respecting other people's point of view. You always, I took that to the Congress. I was raised in a political household and we, we were Democrats, but we respected other people's point of view, and that was part of being a Democrat. Italian-American, proud of our heritage, devoutly Catholic, still in all, still in all, <laughs> fiercely patriotic, fiercely patriotic, as uh, ethnic groups tend to be, and in our case, staunchly democratic. We saw that as part of our faith, do unto others, the gospel of Matthew and the rest. So again, not to convey my point of view to you, but you, your authentic you is what you have to be when you go there. And, and it, whatever it is, whether it's military, corporate America, academia, uh, politics, whatever, just know, be, just value who you are, know your, know your power, because there's nobody, nobody like you. 
So again, consensus building, what I see now that Richard Day, this week, the 100th anniversary of women having the right to vote, they worked so hard, they fought, they struggled, they fought. And when they won, the paper said, women given the right to vote. No, they weren't given anything. They fought for it and they won it and it was important. And we stand on their shoulders of how courageous they were to get, it, uh, to get that done. But the fact is, is that, as I said, not that women are better than men, but the diversity at the table is essential. And women, as I, my, just to your question, that I see are more consensus building. Listen, listen, and, um, and respect other views and try to see, um, people say to me, oh, you really round up your troops as uh, like herding cats. No, it's not like herding cats at all. It's about building consensus, listening to what they care about, how we shape our best possible way forward. So um, know your power, listen, be, build your consensus, but to women especially, I say, be ready. Because I didn't think for a minute I would be going to Congress and never thought I would run for leadership. But I was ready. Well, that's great advice to all those listening. I'm now going to uh, turn it over to Vice Chancellor uh, Francesca Vega to uh, moderate a question and answer if you're open to that, uh, Madam Speaker. My pleasure. Thank you. Hi, Thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank uh, you. Francesca, over to you. Great, thank you, Chancellor Hoggood. And thank you so much, Madam Speaker, for your leadership, engagement, and steadfast support for science, public health, and of course, for UCSF. Uh, there has been a lot of interest in today's conversation with you across the UCSF organization. We currently have nearly 4,000 participants. Wow. Yes, and we have received some, some great questions from our community since the session began. So I will jump into it. We will start with a question from Melissa Trong, who is beginning her sixth year in the developmental and stem cell biology program here at UCSF. Melissa, the floor is yours. Thank you for taking the time to meet with us, Speaker Pelosi, and for always being a great advocate for science. My name is Melissa Trong, and I'm a graduate student studying developmental biology at UCSF. And my research looks at how cells send and receive signals during embryonic development and how those signals can really go awry in cancer disease states. And I do this research in what's called a wet lab, which means that my experiments must be done in the lab with cells and mice. When COVID-19 forced labs at UCSF to shut down, researchers had to immediately scrap experiments, stop breeding mice, and freeze down their cells. As the labs slowly reopen, it will take months to get these experiments back on track and recover from the shutdown. However, we're also facing a whole new set of challenges. With labs operating at 25% capacity, incoming graduate students are not able to learn experimental techniques and rotate in lab. Senior grad students and postdoctoral researchers are unable to find jobs due to university hiring freezes. In particular, those with young children at home are really struggling to juggle childcare and the demands of research. All of this to say that trainees and early career researchers are acutely impacted by this pandemic. And vital research on topics like cancer, neurodegenerative disorders, and heart disease have been delayed, and trainees will have to stay longer in labs, putting additional strain on NIH grants. My question is this. As you continue to negotiate with the Senate and administration for additional COVID-19 funding, is there support for increasing research funding to ensure a robust recovery for the American research enterprise and assistance for early career scientists? Thank you for your question and for your uh, sad but uh, clear description of the challenge uh, that the pandemic places in terms of research and and the opportunity for everyone to participate uh, because of uh, uh, labs being shut down or lack of childcare and, and the connection of all of that. Uh, let me just say that, um, so it, as we have been saying, science is the only way we're gonna crush this virus. So we have to uh, make up for whatever loss there is. And in the um, HEROES Act, we have $4.7 billion, billion dollars in part uh, for the National Institute of Health, in part to make up for the lost research. Uh, we want supplements for research grants and, um, uh, and contracts affected by COVID-19, emergency relief for support, emergency support personnel, 
um, regulatory uh, accommodation uh, for uh, existing grants and contracts. And they're just the practical aspects of it. And we can only do that well if we have the money, the policy, as well as your experience. Your experience, just as you described it there, is a roadmap to some of the things that we have to be sure uh, are not excluded, but are very much prioritized and how we, uh, how we write the law. And then there's certain things that apply to people individually. In other words, what we do on childcare and the rest and how the tax code impacts people for expenditures they're making that they might not have had to make for this. So using policy, appropriations, and the tax code, how we not only uh, in, uh, in the macro sense address the problems that you have described, but in the personal sense, help people uh, uh, cope uh, in a very good way. And again, not to sacrifice the well-being of their children. As I say, people are saving, working to save lives, risking their own lives, and again, uh, at the risk of losing their scientific opportunity or their jobs associated with that. So I thank you for your question. And as with the Chancellor Hargrove's suggestion, Hargrove's suggestion about uh, how we establish something to be to be ready for the pandemic that could be next, uh, that this what you are describing helps us prepare for that as well. So I look forward to continuing that conversation, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for that important question. Uh, now we'll turn to a question that we've actually received again and again from our uh, UCSF community. And that's, uh, you know, as advocates for science, health, and community, what can we at UCSF do to help the democratic process during the pandemic? <laughs> well, uh, vote. <laughs> vote would be a good thing. You used the term earlier, public health. I do think that this uh, pandemic appoints uh, uh, to the need for us to have a greater emphasis on the importance as well as the budgeting priority uh, for public health system. We may need to have a community like a civil conservation corps, but with healthcare workers, this time tracing, but beyond, beyond that, that is culturally appropriate, linguistically uh, prepared to reach out to everyone in our communities, uh, not only to meet their needs, but to invite their leadership into, um, um, into meeting the needs of, of our entire country. And so uh, I would say that, um, again, if you wanted to find something that was everything, it was about health, that was about jobs, it was about children and their future, it was about a sense of community, it was about recognition of the beautiful diversity. I always say of San Francisco, the beauty is our mix. In my Congress, I say our diversity is our strength. Our unity is our power. We can't have unity unless you respect all of the elements of that diversity. So I would say uh, right now, the most important thing is for people to vote and uh, to do so early enough so that their vote is counted as cast. We're having a fight in the COVID and the uh, HEROES Act over the census and how that count will take place and uh, the timing of it and the timing of the reporting of it. So there's some elements right now without sounding partisan, I'm just giving a civic lesson here, where there is um, uh, not a full appreciation of why we need to have an honest count in terms of our census and why people shouldn't be afraid to sign up because of some statements that are made by some and why we have to have an honest count in our election so that it is legitimate and that we have to ignore fear mongering that says we're going to uh, not be able to deliver your mail on time. Don't pay attention to that. Just vote early. Just vote early. Again, know your power in, in all of this. And uh, again, um, if there's one thing that would emerge from this in addition to what the chancellor suggested, which is excellent, excellent. I can't wait to get to work with him on this, as well as what Melissa was saying or the ramifications of all of this is the 
your uh, comments uh, um, about the public, the public health service and how important that is. But for that to succeed, we have to have um, public policy in place. And for that to happen, people who are running for office have to hear from their constituents why this is important and hold us all accountable for that. I see Mark on the line. Yes, Speaker Pelosi, I, I'm here to officially thank you for uh, taking time uh, with us today on behalf of the nearly 4,000 people, but uh, really on behalf of all of us at UCSF, this whole community, the Bay Area, the state, the nation, we're so grateful for your leadership. Uh, you've always been there for us, uh, always listened. Uh, uh, and I think what you've, what people, while they admire what you're doing now, your history of helping uh, the underserved in this country and helping in healthcare is just unsurpassed. And while we call it Obamacare, mm -hmm. there's a little asterisk that says it's really Pelosi care because you made that happen and it has changed and improved the lives of millions of people. So on behalf of all of us, please accept our deep gratitude, admiration, we sleep better at night knowing you're there. So thank you, Speaker Pelosi. I appreciate your saying that. And uh, none of what uh, would, be, would have happened without the courage of my House Democrats, but none of it would have happened without the intellectual resource that you are at UCSF. And I thank you for that and your recognition that our diversity is our strength in our, our community and how we uh, learn from each other, but ha how we need to serve each other as well. Uh, right now, we're fighting for the Affordable Care Act in court. We're fighting for pre-existing conditions. We're fighting for all of that. So the fight never ends. Uh, but at the same time, we're figuring out how we could expand the bill come January. And uh, we'll be in touch with you as we all constantly uh, to see uh, what suggestions you all have. I thank all of you for what you do. God has blessed you with the intellectual curiosity and capacity uh, to follow your dreams and in doing so uh, in a scientific path uh, to make a difference, to make progress for our nation. And so to you, CSF, I say thank you. And to the women out there, congratulations. A hundred years since we've had the vote, we now have to use the vote to make a difference so that we can improve the world for the children. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Pelosi. I'm going to ask the, as, as you leave us, Speaker Pelosi, I'm going to ask the rest of the uh, uh, participants to hang on for a little bit. We have a few other items we want to cover today. Uh, uh, so let me uh, uh, just do to go to that very quickly. Uh, I think we have time for uh, Keith Yamamoto, our special advisor to the Chancellor on Science Policy and Strategy, and Natalie Albert, our Executive Director for Federal Government Relations, uh, to give you a quick overview of our federal government uh, priorities. But there's one thing I want to ask all of you who are watching this, uh, uh, how you can get engaged in something that's really important. It's local. It affects us at UCSF. We will need federal help with it. We're going to need state help with it. We're going to need local help with it. And that's the rebuilding of our Parnassus Heights campus. We are entering a critical phase in the Comprehensive Parnassus Heights plan, as you will hear about it, includes the hospital, research buildings, really the modernization and turning our campus into a true, beautiful campus. But we need everyone to get engaged now. This will be going to the regents uh, for uh, uh, action in uh, early 2021. And I would like to ask all of you, if you are willing to be an advocate for the science, for the teaching, for the community service, uh, for dealing with health equity, uh, for dealing with health care services for people who need it, uh, to go online and text Parnassus, you see it right here, uh, to 52886. That will give you a link on how to sign up, uh, or you can go to ucsf.edu cphp backslash advocate, because what we need from all of you is to join our advocacy efforts uh, to uh, take UCSF even to the next level. Uh, with that, let me turn it over uh, to uh, Natalie Alpert and Keith Yamamoto.
Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Natalie Alpert. I handle federal government relations for UCSF. And as UCSF's liaison to the federal government, it's my job to advocate for um, some of the policies that we were talking about in the conversation today. Um, and, you know, I work to support UCSF's mission to educate, heal, and discover. Um, so that means working to increase investments in biomedical research, promoting UCSF's contributions to healthcare and innovation, and serving as a resource to both policymakers in DC, but also to you all, the UCSF community. Um, there are lots of ways for you to influence policy in your roles at UCSF. Um, in, addi in addition to our UCSF Advocates campaign, um, which I think we're going to hear about for uh, in a few minutes, um, you will, let's see, um, our students, faculty, and clinicians can also share their research and expertise by meeting with policymakers, by participating in legislative briefings, and by weighing in on legislation and regulations that impact the work that you do. Um, so just please look to me and to my colleague, Amy Alden, who handles state and local government as resources um, that you can contact if you hear from an elected official who, who's looking for more information, or um, if you wanna learn more about opportunities to advocate for UCSF at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, so as you may guess, um, for the last six months or so, most of UCSF's federal advocacy has been focused on the government's response to the pandemic. Um, we've been sharing UCSF's research and clinical expertise with members of Congress, including Speaker Pelosi and leaders of the Department of Health and Human Services to help um, shape all kinds of policy, including the expanded telehealth policies that, um, that have been so um, widely used at UCSF, as well as um, helping to address the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color and helping to better target healthcare provider relief fund distributions. Um, we've also been working to help mitigate the impact of lab closures, which Keith Yamamoto will discuss with you in just a minute. Um, so as we look forward towards the election and the final months of this Congress, addressing the impacts of the pandemic will definitely still be among our top priorities as it will be for our nation's policymakers. However, Congress is also quickly closing in on September 30th, which is the deadline to fund the, fe the federal government for FY 2021. So in addition to the stalled COVID-19 supplemental funding package, um, Congress is also going to be under increasing pressure to pass an annual appropriations bill that includes a lot of UCSF's key priorities. Um, including important investments in education, research, and healthcare. So a lot remains uncertain about what the next Congress might look like, um, but we're, we are um, going, we are looking forward to working with Speaker Pelosi under her leadership to push some of our top priorities, which include ensuring access to vital research, including fetal tissue research, working on an infrastructure package that supports the growing needs of our medical and research community, um, and then protecting DACA and undocumented and other vulnerable members of our community, um, just, just to name a few of, of, of the things that we'll be, we'll be looking to do in the coming year. Um, we'll need your voice and your advocacy to accomplish these goals, and um, we hope you'll consider joining us in our efforts. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Keith Yamamoto, Special Advisor to the Chancellor for Science Policy and Strategy, to talk about our work to increase federal investments in research. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Natalie. Um, uh, and, and thanks, all of you, for, for staying uh, on board here. I will just want to say a few words where our time is limited, but a few words about our uh, research advocacy efforts. I'm going to focus on Washington, D.C. We're also uh, active uh, at the state level. Uh, but in, in D.C., uh, we are really actively in, in conversations with uh, members of Congress, including Speaker Pelosi, of course, uh, but uh, also with uh, elements of the administration, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is the uh, President's uh, Office of Science. Uh, the the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, of which the NIH is um, uh, one. And 
uh, to respond to the is Melissa Melissa Trump so well um, documented in her question to the speaker. Um, the, the effect of the shutdown was devastating in really stopping all research that's not related to COVID-19. Um, and of course, uh, really putting a stop So unfortunately, it looks like we lost Keith. So what I would like to do real quickly, unless Keith can rejoin us, we have just a few minutes left. I wanted to uh, just very briefly, of course, thank Natalie and Keith. I'm sorry that we lost Keith. And I wanted to uh, thank all of you for joining us here today for this very important uh, discussion. Uh, this was just a snapshot of the advocacy priorities that we have in front of us. Uh, now is uh, the ask of all of you, and that's ensuring that our voice is indeed heard uh, and we are aware of all of the opportunities that we have within the UCSF community to get engaged. So make sure you check your voter registration and you update that information. We also have a couple of upcoming virtual events that I think would be very helpful. Uh, I want to ensure that you are uh, educated and well-versed on the priorities, some of what you heard today, and other ways that we can engage to ensure that UCSF voice is heard. We need to vote early and safely, of course. So here's some information for you. I want to acknowledge Allie Jones, who is part of the community and government relations team and is managing the various uh, voter engagement efforts across the UCSF organization. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate it.